Chapter 3, Section 4, Counting Atoms. Let's talk about atomic mass. So at this point we've looked at the bell ringer, which asks you to look at the number of copper atoms that was calculated on page 100 of your textbook. And that value is that there are 2.97 times 10 to the 22nd copper atoms. So we know from our discussion earlier that this is a very large number. And you were supposed to tell me what this tells you about the size of the atom. And what this tells us is that atoms are very, very small. So if atoms are so small, the gram would not be a very convenient union for expressing mass. So we came up with a special mass referred to as atomic mass. The unit for atomic mass is ANUs, which is the abbreviation for atomic mass units. One way to determine atomic mass is to check the periodic table. So if I look at the periodic table, each element on the periodic table has its own box. So here is the box for carbon. And we can see that in the upper left-hand corner, it gives me the symbol. In the bottom, it gives me the name of the element. In the upper right-hand corner, I see a large number six, which we know at this point is the atomic number. But underneath that is a number with a decimal. This 12.011 is the atomic mass for carbon. So in other words, there are 12.01 AMUs. So for us, this is really worthless because we do not have AMU scales in our lab. Our scales read in grams. Well, we know a relationship between AMUs and grams, that one AMU is equal to 1.6606 times 10 to the negative 24th grams. Again, we've talked about scientific notation, so we know that times 10 to the negative 24th would be a very, very small number. So how do I weigh out carbon if its mass is in AMUs? And even if I convert from AMUs to grams, I still don't have the appropriate scale. So chemists saved the day. Some brilliant chemists came up with the idea that since our real scales measure in grams, they would figure out how many single atoms of carbon it would take to equal 12.01 grams of carbon. And this is referred to as Avogadro's number. So Avogadro's number is determined by the number of carbon atoms in exactly 12 grams, which would be approximately 12.01 AMUs of pure carbon-12. Now the reason why we're talking about carbon-12 is that carbon-12 is an isotope of carbon. We identify isotopes by their mass number, so that's what the number after the hyphen means. And carbon has also been determined to be the standard for atomic mass. And there's a little bit of history about atomic mass units in your textbook, it's on page 104. But carbon was not the original standard. So originally, they were gonna use hydrogen as a standard but since hydrogen doesn't react with many elements, it was not very convenient. So they went on and they thought, well, let's use oxygen because oxygen combines with almost all other elements. However, oxygen exists as three isotopes. So physicists and chemists could not agree on the value for the atomic mass of oxygen to be used. So again, in 1960, at a conference of chemists and physicists, they agreed that a scale would be based on the isotope of carbon. And this is the same scale that is used today. So this means that atomic mass unit is exactly one twelfth of the mass of one carbon-12 atom. So again, remember that 
we're going to figure out how many single atoms it would take to equal 12.01 grams of carbon. And they figured out that there are 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And we refer to this many atoms equivalent to 12.01 grams of carbon as Avogadro's number. So we can relate atoms, molecules, to our concept of the mole. Now the mole is actually a concept we're going to look at in one of the models in this chapter. But if I look at this relationship, this tells me that I have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of carbon in one mole of carbon 12. So Avogadro's number is going to be a number that you're going to need to memorize. We're going to use it consistently throughout the year. So we looked at atomic mass of carbon, but we can explore atomic mass with all the other elements using the periodic table, and they would have units of AMUs. But what's really most useful for us as chemists is to be able to look at the relationship between grams, because that's what our balance uses, and the number of atoms. So we would have to look at the relationship between grams and moles. And this is known as molar mass. So molar mass is the mass of one mole of a pure substance. So notice here that there are 12.01 grams of carbon in one mole of carbon. And so the molar mass for carbon would be 12.01 grams per mole is the unit for molar mass. So again, it's the same numerical value that we looked at for atomic mass. The main difference between atomic mass and molar mass is the unit. Atomic mass uses units of AMU, and molar mass uses units of grams per mole. All right, so let's just verify that we really do understand how to determine the molar mass of an element. Again, we're going to refer to our periodic table. So here is lead, and if I find the decimal number in lead's box, this shows me that lead has a molar mass of 207.2 grams per mole. Now one of the things we want to recognize about molar mass is we're always going to round the values from the periodic table to four significant figures. And this is the way that we're all consistent in our mathematical work. If I look at silicon and I round this molar mass to four sig figs, we can see that it has a molar mass of 28.09 grams per mole. And the last one we're going to look at is iron, and iron has a molar mass of 55.85 grams per mole. Now you can see that the molar mass is one of the derived units we had talked about in a previous video segment, that it has the unit for mass divided by the unit for the amount of a substance. So molar mass is a derived unit. So we can kind of combine all of our information together, grams, moles, and atoms. And we're going to do that by looking at iron. So if I have one mole of iron, we know that it has 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of iron. And then this would also be equal to the value on the periodic table. And there's actually a misprint on this slide it should say that there are 55.85 grams of iron. Okay, so all of these values are equal to each other. And these values we're going to use as conversion factors. So we're going to be converting in the model in this chapter between atoms and moles. We're also going to convert between moles and grams. All right, let's talk a little more about the value that we find on the periodic table. The value on the periodic table is really the average atomic mass. And the definition for the average atomic mass is that this is the weighted average of the atomic masses of the naturally occurring isotopes of an element. So the element we're going to look at is copper. And copper has two isotopes. You can see here that it has the isotope copper 63 and copper 65. 
By weighted average, we mean its percent abundance, how often it's found in nature. So that's this first number that we see here. Now, if we take our percent and we divide by 100, it gives us the decimal values that we see here. So in other words, in nature, 69.15% of the time we find copper 63, and in nature, 30.85% of the time we find copper 65. We're going to multiply their percent abundance by their atomic mass units. And then if I sum those values together, this gives me 63.55 AMUs. So if I compare the number on the previous slide that we calculated using the weighted averages of the naturally occurring isotopes of copper to what we see on the periodic table, what this tells us is that the periodic table is the average atomic mass of all the isotopes of that element. So the values that we're using from the periodic table are the average atomic masses of all the naturally occurring isotopes of that element.